You have a pen, I trust, a place for you to do some fill-ins. We're going to be spending our time in Romans chapter 8. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the time that we can be here together. We ask that this, this time that we spend in your word that would be used to magnify your name. And we thank you for the entire book of Romans, for the entire New Testament, for the Old Testament, for your ability to speak to man in ways that we can understand. But Lord, when you speak to us, you demand our entire attention. It's not something we can be walking by and say, oh, I, I, I heard you, Lord. We have to be looking straight at you with our ears so that we can hear what you have to say. This morning we ask that all of our attention will be given to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. There is no slavery in victory, just freedom. Slavery can take on many forms. Even without thinking, we can discover ourselves chained and enslaved. Paul wrote, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, slaves to obey, you are that one slave to whom you obey? This is voluntary slavery. And there are three facets to slavery. The desire of the flesh. The misuse of appetites. The desire of the eyes, the misapplied sense of beauty, and thirdly, the pride of life. An inordinate ambition. Biblical, biblical characters abound who have become slaves. You know their names so well, and when we read through, we do not think of them as slaves, we think of them as liberators. And yet, was Samson not a slave to the desires of his flesh? David was enslaved to the desires of his eyes. And Nebuchadnezzar fell in his pride. These three great characters of the Bible could not overcome their slavery. Then what hope is there for you and I? By the grace of God, all three of them enjoyed freedom. Samson was delivered from slavery by death. David by confession and Nebuchadnezzar by humility. As we look into Romans chapter 8, turn in your Bibles there with me. Romans chapter 8 will be our main focus. It has been said that Rome, Romans is the golden ring of the Bible and chapter 8 is the gem. Another way to put this and I like it a little bit better, is that Romans is the gem of the Bible. And chapter 8 is that sparkle that comes off your diamond ring. Paul wrote Romans 8 to express the freedom that every Christian enjoys. He tied up his thoughts by bringing together the great truths found in chapters 1 through 7. The condemnation that is leveled against all mankind does not apply to those who are in Christ. Those who are in Christ Jesus are justified. Those who are in Christ Jesus are sanctified, set apart, holy. And those in Christ Jesus in chapter 8 are glorified. The victory is in Jesus. He began... He begins and ends the chapter with this phrase, in Jesus Christ. Look with me in verse 1. It is therefore now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Underline that. Circle it. Mark it so it reminds you of the importance. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, of being in Christ. Then turn with me to verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Victory provides for us freedom. This morning we're going to examine the effects of freedom and how that freedom affords us some great truths. First, there is freedom from the law. There is freedom from the law. Second, there's freedom to follow the Spirit. 
If we've been freed from the law, now we are free to follow the Spirit. Third, there is freedom with glory. Freedom with glory. And fourth, there is freedom in love. Turn with me to our first point as we look at freedom from the law in chapter 8. Paul declares in chapter 8, verse 1, as a result of everything that he has said in verses 1 through 7, he says, there is now, therefore, no condemnation. The therefore points back to everything else before. Because we conclude 1 through 7, now, therefore, there is no condemnation. And Paul establishes the basis for that, and he gives us a picture. What is the basis of our free freedom? It is being in Christ. Our position in Christ. Who are you? Who am I? I am a son, a child of God, because of the great things that I've done. No. Because I'm a pastor of a church. No. Because I was born into a Christian family. No. Because I am in Christ. Our position in Christ can be seen in chapter 6, where the Holy Spirit grabs us and takes us and identifies us with being in Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And therefore, as Christ was risen from the dead, we also are in Christ in his resurrection. Therefore, we have the opportunity, the privilege, to live a new life. We'll see that in a moment in the picture. But first, the problem. What is the problem in chapter, or excuse me, chapter, or excuse me, verse 3, he says, What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh. The law was weak. It could not save man. The law can only condemn. The law can only say is, here's what you're supposed to do. And then when you do what's wrong, it says, there, bad. Since you've done something wrong, you must pay the penalty. That is what the law does. That is the purpose of the law. You and I have felt the pressures of law through our entire life. Our parents tell us, you must do this, because if you do not do this, then you will receive this. There will be a punishment. Clean your room, or you'll be punished. Brush your teeth or you'll be punished. That's the law. The law is weak. But knowing that the law was weak, God had a plan. God's plan was to intercede by sending help. You and I could not fulfill the law, and each time you and I have tried to fulfill the law, we always come out as on the losing end. We fail. But God sent someone to intercede on our behalf. He sent help. The help that he sent was Jesus Christ. In John chapter 3, verse 16, we know that verse so well. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only... God gave his son, Jesus Christ. Wow. God sent help. Christ was the likeness of sinful flesh. Or excuse me, Christ took on the form of us. He was in the form of sinful flesh, but he never sinned himself. Remember back in John, Christ came and dwelt among us. He tabernacled. He took on the form of men and walked among us. And yet, through the entire life, he did not sin. When God said something needed to be done, Christ's attitude was, yes, Lord, I will do it. It was, oh, I'll get to it later. It was right away he obeyed. Not only that, in verse 3, we see that Christ bore our sins on his body, on the cross. He was the sin offering. God sent Christ, not just to live among us, but to intercede on your part and my part. And there... When all of the sins were laid on him at the cross, Christ then in turn said, 
sin is condemned. It is done away with. Therefore, you and I do not face the problem of double, je double jeopardy. The act of putting a person through a second trial for an offense which he or she has already been prosecuted and convicted. You and I cannot face the penalty for our sin because Christ has already paid for those sins. Does that give us the freedom to do what we want? No. That shows that we have an obligation. That points us back to the one who died, Jesus Christ. So when the accuser comes knocking and says, you're a sinner. You know you're a sinner. You know deep down in your heart what you thought last week, what you saw, what you heard. You are not worthy of God. And God is going to punish you. Oh, how Satan works in our mind to twist and change things. But God has already paid for that sin through Jesus Christ. So you and I cannot be held accountable. When we come before the holy God, He does not say, let's take a look at all of your sins. No. Christ has saved us from the law of sin and death. Look with me in verse 3 again. He condemns sin in the flesh. Now to verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Freedom. Not hindered. Nothing controlling us. Nothing pulling us down. There is the basis for this. But what's the picture? The picture is an illustration of, of being in Christ. In verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, same word again, in Christ, has made me free from the law. Here we have a, a little action figure. Just a little man. His name is Indiana. Jones. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I'm holding the Jones. He represents like you and I, we're sinners before God. But if you go back to, to Romans chapter 6, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? No. Or do you not know that you have been identified with Christ? You have died in your sins and you've been risen again? The Holy Spirit takes us and places us in Christ. So we are identified with his death, burial, and resurrection. What does that look like? You and I are placed in Christ in the sphere, sealed by the Holy Spirit, placed. So, in the tomb, you and I were buried with Christ, but the tomb could not hold him. Where did he go? He rose from the, get, from the dead. He is now at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, where's, where are you and I right now? We also are at the right hand of the Father because we are in Christ. Death has no power over Christ, nor does it have over you and I. You say, well, wait a minute. All of us do, will die. Yes, that's true, unless the Lord returns and we are caught up together. But what he's talking about, it doesn't have power. It's not final. There is something more to our life than just dying and laying in a grave somewhere. The power of sin has been broken. You and I no longer have to obey sin because we are in Christ. What power does sin have over Jesus Christ? None. What power does death? None. What power does it have over you and I? None unless we submit to it. As Romans 6 continues, you are slave of whoever you submit yourself to. But our position in Christ is pictured this, right here. So when God sees me, he doesn't just see me outside of Christ because he can't. He sees us in Christ. That is a wonderful thing. Because what he sees then is the righteousness of Christ in me, 
in that righteousness. He doesn't see my filthy rags. He sees me dressed in the righteousness of Christ. So why wouldn't God hear your prayers? Why wouldn't God listen to us? We're in Christ. That's the picture. That's the reality of being in Christ. What can pull us out of Christ? Is there any power on earth? God does not give us power to overcome sin. God comes into you and you overcome sin when you yield to him. One might think that we, are, we were to be dependent upon him every moment of the day, of every hour. And that would be correct. We are to live completely dependent upon him. Therefore, you are free from the law, but you are also free to follow the Spirit. So your second point. Freedom to follow the Spirit. When we follow the Spirit in verses 5 through 17, there is no debt. There's no condemnation. There is no debt. Often we speak of, of the Christian in this passage who walks in the Spirit and of a Christian who walks after the flesh. But God does not speak in this manner. He speaks of the Christian and of the non-Christian. Notice with me in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded, fleshly minded, is death. Verse 7. But the carnal mind is intimate with God, for it, does, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who follow the flesh have a certain mindset, and that mindset focuses on the things of the flesh. Paul calls them the works of the flesh in Galatians. He says they are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, and outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelry, and the like. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Their mindset will result in death because their focus is not on the things of heaven, but they are the things here below. In each one of the works of the flesh, it's always about putting the flesh first before someone else. It's always me-centered. It's never Christ-centered. Their thinking is contrary to God. They cannot and they will not sub be subjected to the Word of God. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't. Their mind, if you will, is a playground for sin. It is the spot where sin is exercised and strengthened. Sin starts here in our thinking. We, we all know this too well. As a matter of fact, as we, let me illustrate that with two brothers that you know from the Bible. One was named Cain. The other was Abel. Both of them were serving the Lord. And one brought the correct sacrifice to the Lord. Now, we don't know exactly what that is, but apparently God had talked to them and told them, here's what you are to do. And one decided, I'll do it my way. And the other decided to follow suit. Cain killed Abel. But before Cain killed Abel, God came to him and said, and told him and warned him. He said, Cain, sin is sitting outside the door of your mind. Don't give in to it. Don't let it be thought. Don't let it go run through your mind and think about it. The following day, Cain and Abel are out in the field. And Cain told Abel. I've never noticed that before. 
Cain told Abel the conversation that he had with God and his struggle. But something went on during that time while they were out there. And his pride got the better of him. And it, came, and it became action. And he slew his brother. Cain could not please God. But you and I are different. We are not of the flesh. However, the flesh remains in the believer. You may even feel fleshy when you are not yielding to God. You can follow the flesh or you can follow the Spirit. In verses 9 through 13, Paul says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. Those who follow the Spirit are no longer debtors to the flesh. Look with me in verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors. We are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But we are debtors to the Spirit. One who is in debt is obligated to his creditor. For example, if you go out today and you buy a television, let's say you buy the largest television that's out there, and it only runs a whopping $2,000. But it's a nice television. You don't have the cash to pay for it, so you put it on credit. Your plan is to pay for it later. That's a good plan. Many people shared that plan. So if we're all doing it, it can't be wrong. Along the way, something happens in your life, and you can no longer pay for it. That television does not belong to you. It belongs to your creditor. As a matter of fact, each week out of your paycheck, a certain predetermined amount belongs to the creditor, not to you, because you've made that arrangement already. But once the television is paid for, you are financially free from your creditor. You are free to do with that money whatever you want. You are free to use your television and to enjoy it. Because once the debt has been paid, there is no obligation anymore. That is also true with the debt of sin. The account has been paid in full by Jesus Christ. This also gives us a unique privilege that we've never had in the flesh. Walking in the Spirit gives us spiritual privileges that perhaps you and I have never really noticed. But in verses 14 through 17, he says, For as many that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. There's the privilege of title. The sons of God are those who have, who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They have the gift of eternal life. There's the privilege of adoption. In verse 14, for as many, no, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but to receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, or Father, Father. The privilege of, of adoption is not the same type of adoption that you and I think of when we go out and we want to adopt someone into our family. The adoption that's here in the Bible is one who is placed into a family at full maturity. Imagine, for all of you that are over 21, that someone comes along and says, I want to adopt you. By the way, I own Microsoft. And as an adult son, you get to run and do whatever you want with the company. Because that's what sonship's all about. Being adopted into the, into, into the family of God means that you receive the full privileges of a mature son and daughter. You don't start off as a baby. You start off with full rights. You have access to see God anytime you want. You don't have a babysitter. You can come before him and say, Lord. And he says, my son, my daughter. We get all the privileges that a father would give to his son. Not only that, we have the privilege to walk by the Spirit. We are led by the Spirit. We don't follow other things. 
we listen carefully, we read God's word, and we follow the direction that the Holy Spirit uses to guide us. Verse 17. Well, let me, let me back up verse 16. And here, the Holy Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We have the privilege to be called children of God. And if children, verse 17, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We have a privilege of claim. As joint heirs, we have claim on all things that Christ has. You see, when we come into the family of God, we are not subjects. We are princesses and princes. We come in because of God's grace in Christ with the same rank and privileges. He might be above us, but we are joint on everything else. How can all this be ours? Did we work for it? No. No, it is by God's grace that we receive that. And yet, the best is still yet to come. Will the future be worth the present suffering that we, that we go through today? Freedom can only truly be experienced with glory. And our third point, on your back, is we have freedom with glory. In verses 18 through 30, Paul starts off, For I consider the suffering of this present time not to be worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Then look at verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And these he called, he also justified. And those he justified, these he also glorified. He begins this next section, the freedom with glory, dealing with just that. What does it mean for us to be glorified? How is the Christian's life different or going to be different than it is today? What we see of Christianity is such a small part as opposed to what it's going to be like with glory. The freedoms that you, that you experience in Christ are nothing compared to the glories that we will share in a glorified body. Paul lays out the overall principle. The overall principle for the glorified body is simply this. And we need to remember this. His eye could, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be in the same ballpark with what's to come. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're going through, as tough as it is to imagine this, the struggles that we face, it cannot even be compared to what it's going to be like when we're with him. For us, our struggles seem to overwhelm us. Like we're on a little rowboat and we're out in the middle of the sea and a big wave comes and it's swelling and it just swamps us. And we count ourselves lucky if we're still with the boat. But whatever those struggles are, whether it's cancer, whether it is some sort of sin that we are struggling with, it is nothing to be compared to the glory that's going to come. The glory that's going to be, that is going to come, there is a great expectation. In verse 19, for the earnest expectation, that is repeated again. In verse 23, eagerly awaiting. Verse 25, eagerly awaiting. And it's interesting that creation eagerly awaits this. Back in verse 19. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation, it says, moans under the influence, under the effect of sin. It groans, not in the audible voice. I don't hear plants, even though these are silk. They're not groaning. It is that under the pressures of things not working right, it expects and waits for it to work right. If you've ever had your transmission slip in your car, there's a whole bunch of these little cogs and wheels. And typically your mechanic will pull everything out and say, yes. He'll pull out your transmission fluid and say, yes, 
you've got a problem in there. You'll find little pieces of metal all scattered in the bottom, which is really a bad sign. You're going to need new transmission. You can say, ah, it still works. You're right. You can get in the car and you can go, and you'll be driving along and ee. The gears aren't ki- connecting like they're supposed to. Eventually, destruction. Your car's just not going to go anymore. But when the things are aligned correctly, when the new cogs are in place, everything will move smoothly and there won't be any grinding or moaning anymore. Creation waits the glorification of what's to come. Christians, in verse 23, they're also eagerly awaiting the redemption of our bodies. We wait for our hope, Jesus Christ, to return, to complete the work that he's begun. And we also groan. The Christian groans. Again, that's not an outwardly groan. That is, I'm tired of this weak body. It's falling apart. It's tough to grow old. It's tough to be young and to fall down. But at least you can get back up. But we're moving to a point in which we will not have that problem anymore. Our bodies will be transformed. The struggles that we face will be nothing. Verse 26, and the spirit groans also. Likewise, that likewise points up to the eagerly awaiting in verse 25. The Holy Spirit is also eagerly awaiting and helps in our weakness, for we do not know how we should pray. There is this expectation in which perfect communication is going to take place, in which you and I will be able to know the will of God, and we will follow it perfectly. And as we speak to Him, it will be completely in His will. And our fellowship will be perfectly complete. That will be freedom with glory. Paul says, what shall we say to all these things? In verses 39, or 31 through 39, he attacks the last, the last point. The freedom in love. No separation. Freedom in love. In love, there is no separation. Notice with me. In verse 31, all the personal pronouns, us, because they reveal the direction of God's love. Follow with me as I read verse 31 through 37. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? God is for us. Often you may not think God is for you. You may think just the opposite. God is against me. No, believer, God is for you because you are in Christ. So his riches and his glory and his mercy and all the riches that he has are for you. That's what Ephesians chapter 1 talks about. We have all the blessings in heaven. Verse 32, and he did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us. This is an argument from the least to the greater. So in other words, if God gives us salvation while we were sinners, what is God going to give us now that we're saints? What? can We, we can't even imagine that. If God is so good to us, while we look at, upon Him and say, Lord, I do, not, I do not want you to be in control of my life. I do not want you in my life. He says, I am sending my Son Christ to die for you. And we respond, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. What more will God give to us now that we are his children? Verse 33. Whom shall he bring charge, or who shall bring charge against God's elect? God's elect is us. It is God who justifies us. Us is not in there, but it's implied. Verse 35. Or 34, excuse me. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. We've got Christ, we've got the Holy Spirit 
both make an intercession for you and me. And in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That idea of separate is the same word that we use for divorce. Who can divorce us from the love of Christ? There is no power in the universe that can do this. No power at all, verses 37 through 39. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angel, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to divorce us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a victory we have in Jesus. Do you know what that means? We have a confident future. We can invest in spiritual things and see a return. We can be bold in sharing Christ with others because we are in Christ. Recently, Chick-fil-A came under some scrutiny for their stance on biblical marriage. They took a stand and they said, we believe this because it's from the Bible. And they have felt media attention drawn towards them, negative media. They have felt boycotts. But God says, I will do all things for good. That is good? I would not want somebody boycotting me or putting me on the news as, that I am, there's something wrong with me for doing something that's right. But God says he does all things for the good. For those that love him. For those who are in Christ. The reaction to this, Chick-fil-A has had a huge increase in their business. They have sold more chicken than they've ever sold. Whether you like Chick-fil-A or not, if you like their food, irrelevant. The bottom line is, is that they took a stand. God has blessed them. He has used things that we would say that's evil, and he's turned them into good. Only God can do that. God works all things together for those who love him, for those who are in Christ. That's you and me. If you believed in Jesus Christ, you are in him. Fully righteous, fully glorified, fully set with a future. What will your future be like? Your future will always be with Christ because you are in Christ. If you're not inside the sphere of Christ, then you don't know Jesus. And that means you will spend an eternity outside of him. You will never receive the blessings that he has to offer. There is no reason for you and I not to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. If you have not done that, if you have not said, Lord, I believe that Jesus died on the cross, just like your word says. I am trusting in everything that you say by grace alone through faith that you raised him Christ from the dead. I don't understand all the theological implications and everything, but I am trusting that you're able to do exactly what you say. I'm not asking anybody to come forward, but I do want you when I pray, I want you to go before the Lord yourself and talk to him in your own words. The Bible doesn't lay out a special prayer manual to say do it this way. God wants you to come before him the way you are. And when you do, you will have victory in Jesus. And that will be our closing song. And that song deals with our past, present, and future. Let's pray. Let me follow. We thank you for our time together. We thank you for the future bright hope that we have. That is not a, it is not a time of hopelessness in which we have nothing to look forward to, but it is a time where we have everything to look forward to. And we thank you for the gift of your son that has allowed us 
to stand before you. We ask, Lord, that throughout the rest of this day, that we would take what we've learned and apply it to our life, that we might continually be conformed to the image of your Son, just like you stated in your purpose. And we do that, and we'll give you all the glory for doing that. In Jesus' name, amen.